Hello, brothers and sisters. This is the Remnant Warrior from Kingdom Productions Network. I wanted to thank you all for watching this video and all Kingdom Productions Network content and ask that you please hit the like button because it truly helps the channel grow and new people see the content. And if you aren't already subscribed, please consider hitting the subscribe button and the notification bell so that you'll know each time we upload new content. Grace and peace. Welcome to another edition of the Remnant Report. I am your host, the Remnant Warrior, along with my co-host, all the way from beautiful South Africa, always warm, lovely weather, I'm sure. I don't know from experience, but uh, I'm sure it's got to be better than this crazy weather we have here in South Carolina. Uh, I apologize if the screen flip-flopped there at the beginning. I, I hit something and I saw it flip-flop on my screen, so hopefully it only did it on my end and you guys won't have to worry about you know seeing all that and it bothering you but um we are back for episode two of the remnant report for 2024 this is season five i can't believe that we've been you know i know you haven't been on board for five years but I can't believe that I'm going into the fifth year of the Remnant Report, and, and um, that's with taking a year off to do Return of the Historic Faith with Brother Matthew Marcel. So, uh, uh, but yeah, time, the, time flies. Um, I mean, it feels like uh, just the other day when it was um, when the month of December 2023 started and. I mean, we're all already almost half, halfway through January 2024 now, so yeah. it's just crazy how time flies. Absolutely it is. Tonight, we are going to be, we're going to be sticking with the topic that we've kind of been on both in the Remnant Report episodes that brother Tertius and i do together as well as the individual bible studies that i do and that he does we're both actually doing a bible study on revelation right now brother Tertius is covering something that i think is extremely important and hardly no one does this He's doing a verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter, in-depth study of the book of Revelation, and he's doing an awesome job. And I'm not just saying that because he's my friend and my co-host. He, he truly is doing an awesome job. Um, I watch it. I mean, if, if I'm watching it, then it's got to be worth watching because I don't just watch anything on YouTube. Especially on uh, our channel, you know, because um, usually I'm in it. But yeah, no, you're doing a great job, brother. And I am actually covering specific parts of the book of Revelation. Like I'm getting ready to do part two of the 144,000 episode. And tonight we're going to be continuing that theme of Bible prophecy. But we're going to be taking it back to the Old Testament, and we're going to be we're going to be looking at a theme that God does with His people, whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament. You know, regardless what covenant it is, the people of God are kept safe, watched over. They are taken care of and we're going to see that tonight when we go back to the book of Daniel um, to start 
tonight's program off, I'm actually going to be turning things over to Brother Tertius to let him take over in the book of Daniel in a specific uh, part of Daniel. But we're going to be looking at um, the way that God took care of Daniel, um, the way God took care of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in uh, the fiery furnace, um, Daniel in the lion's den, Daniel with the dreams, um, just throughout the time of captivity that the southern kingdom of Judah was in captivity in Babylon, you had the all the people from the, the kingdom were in captivity, or the majority of them. And you had the righteous mixed in with the wicked, those who chose to uh, worship the gods of Babylon and eat the king's meat that was sacrificed to idols. And, you know, they, they chose the easy route. But then you had people like Daniel and the other people who were loyal and obedient to the Most High God. And we see in the scriptures the way that God not only took care of them, but made sure that they thrived. And they, they literally, in, like in Daniel's case, Daniel was a prophet. And... I'm not saying that everybody who is obedient to God will be a prophet or, or anything like that. But what I am saying is it is a very, very good example of the way God takes care of his people. But I'm going to turn things over to Brother Tertius. And we are going to start off in the book of Daniel. If you have your Bibles, you can read along with us. I'm actually going to be using the Bible on my phone. But, Brother okay. Tertius, I turn it over to you, my friend. Okay. So, um, first of all, if if you, if you we start with, Jan, with Daniel chapter 1, then we see that um, the young Israelites, Israelites are at the Babylonian court. Now, what I just want to mention here quickly is that what people need to uh, remember in this regard is that um, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar is actually considered to be one of the um, Old Testament foreshadowings of the Antichrist of Revelation chapter 13. Now, when a king like Nebuchadnezzar calls uh, young men from Israel to his court, we will note that he, you know, he basically questions them, he tests their knowledge and also part of his requirement was that those who get summoned to his court should be good looking and they should be wise and they should be eager to learn and so on. There's a very good reason why he is doing this and the reason is he wants these young men who are the wisest of Israel, he basically wants to take the wisest people of Israel and train them in the Babylonian mysteries. And that's a very important point because a lot of people will read Daniel and just, um, you know, they, they will just think that this was just uh, some conversation that Nebuchadnezzar had with the young Israelites. But it was it was more than that. Um, what we see, if, if you if you go to the New Testament and you look at Ephesians 6, there's a reason why part of the spiritual armor, the armor of God, there's the breastplate of righteousness uh, that guards your heart. For example, if you, if your heart is focused on human righteousness and the righteousness of this world and the righteousness of the mysteries and the righteousness of earthly kings, then obviously you're going to um, get yourself into a kind, uh, a mindset where you think that uh, vengeance is the only option. And that's the way that the Babylonians, uh, the Assyrians, the Canaanites, all these people, that's the way that they operated. Um, you made them angry, they would um, re take revenge on you in the most gruesome way. I mean, the Assyrians were 
controversial for one of the things that they did was they literally put hooks through people's noses and parts of their faces. It was just gruesome. Um, and they would um, attach chains to, uh, chains to the hooks and basically drag the people around, um, which is totally gruesome. But Daniel and the other wise young men of Israel getting summoned to the king, he's actually trying to infiltrate their minds and he's trying to infiltrate their hearts. If you can infiltrate someone's mind at a young age, and if you infiltrate someone's heart at a young age, then you can easily brainwash them and basically program them. So this whole thing of programming people and so on is, is nothing new. Where people think when they hear programming, brainwashing, they think of it as modern concepts. Um, but it's actually a very old thing. And that's what we see with um, the young men of Israel being summoned to the king's court. If he can brainwash them, and train them up in the Babylonian mysteries. He can basically do a lot of damage regarding the faith of the Israelites, regarding their traditions and everything. So that's just something that I wanted to mention. So I'll start reading for us um, Daniel chapter 1. Okay. Um, Before you start reading, I just wanted mm -hmm. to point something out that you said. Um, you were talking about how it's not new, the brainwashing. And one of the places that Jewish mysticism, which eventually became Kabbalah, comes from is their time in Babylon. Yeah. And one of the ways that people are programmed, matter of fact, the CIA uses the, the Sephirot tree. The Kabbalistic Sephirot tree, the tree you see in Kabbalah with each Sephirot, that, that's a programming template. And they, they literally use it to um, fracture people's minds and, and program them. Um, yeah. A lot of people aren't aware of that, but it's just another reason why Kabbalah is so dangerous and why it needs to be, you know, stayed completely away from. Exactly, that's a very good point, brother, because, um, you know, um, you can go so deep into this uh, when you realize, uh, for example, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this, the CIA, because um, it, it goes back to the, the time just after the Second World War, where um, a lot of uh, Nazi scientists were basically given, they were welcomed into the USA, and they, um, they didn't only help out with... Um, developing new scientific things. They also helped out with the MK Ultra brainwashing programs. And, you know, you after, after the Second World War, you have a massive amount of satanic cults all over the world who learned this stuff and um, who used brainwashing, um, causing minds to fracture, this, causing dissociative identity disorder and so on. And this, this had a massive impact on a lot of people all over the world. And like you rightfully noted, it can be traced back to ancient Babylon. It comes thousands of years, you know, and from ancient Babylon, you can even trace it further back, obviously, to the um, to Genesis chapter three, where uh, the serpent said to Eve, well, um, your eyes will open, you, will, you won't die, your eyes will be opened and you will you will become like God, knowing good and evil. And obviously also Genesis six, the watchers teaching occult science, abortion, you name it to all the people as we also see in the book of First Enoch, and then obviously Genesis chapter 11, where you have the um, Tower of Babel and, and everything that happened there. Um, but, so, um, I'll start reading for us Daniel chapter 1. Um, in the third year of the reign of King jo Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave King Jehoiakim of Judah into his power, as well as some of the vessels of the house of God. These he brought to the land of Shinar, and he placed the vessels in the treasury of his gods. Then the king commanded his palace master, Ashpenaz, to bring some of the Israelites of the royal family and of the nobility. Young men without physical defect and handsome, versed in every branch of wisdom, endowed with knowledge and insight, and competent to serve in the king's palace. They were to be taught the literature and language of the Chaldeans. Uh, just also uh, take note that teaching people 
a language and a literature language itself is can be a very very emotional tool um, communication language and so on can be a very uh, useful tool also um, in brainwashing people because language has a very emotional aspect embedded in it um, you know uh, some people are more prone to it because some people are seen as emotional communicators others are uh, less emotional when they communicate but um, overall language itself can be a very powerful tool um, and also you know if you talk to people who have been um, in, involved with high level uh, occult um, groups and, and cults and so on they will tell you that um, in the highest levels you know these people actually know um, some of the ancient druidic languages they know the ancient chaldean languages they it's 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 mind-blowing you know the stuff that they know and obviously for them it comes down to the aspect of the more wisdom they have about these things the better they are and the higher level they can reach and so on which is once again the direct contrast of the wisdom and knowledge that we find in jesus christ because the wisdom and the knowledge that we find in jesus christ as we read about it in um, Ephesians um, chapter 3, verse 18 and 19, the Apostle Paul talks about the length, the breadth, the height and the depth of the wisdom of God. And that wisdom is the wisdom and knowledge that is in Jesus Christ that you can only have if you are born again and the Holy Spirit um, reveals that knowledge to you by through the Word of God. Um, once again, also when... Um, the apostle paul talks about in ephesians 1 chapter ephesians chapter 1 verses 18 and 19 he talks about the eyes of your hearts that are enlightened and that also is people um focusing their hearts not on human righteousness but on the righteousness of god they have the breastplate of righteousness and once again coming back to what we've said earlier um, the way the Bab Babylonians, for example, operated was the complete opposite. For them, righteousness could be found in the courts of Babylon. You know, it's um, their form of righteousness was perfect in their own eyes. Um, which once again reminds us of of, this, of of the verses that you read in Proverbs chapter six, that tells you that one of the seven things that that um, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob hates is eyes that are filled with pride. And pride is something that the Babylonians, the ancient Babylonians were, they, they were brilliant at that. Um, you know, also the ancient Egyptians and all those people, they were, they, they were um, very prideful. And that is why when, whenever the Israelites fell into the worship of idols, the worshiping of idols, they also became proud, uh, proudful, they became arrogant, boastful and so on. And that's why in, in a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the prophetic books of the Old Testament, you'll see that the Lord absolutely, absolutely resents the people for having this kind of attitude of, oh, well, um, we know we're not doing the right things, but we'll just bring a few sacrifices to the Lord and that will make it right. Yeah. You know, and that's yeah. why that's why he said to Isaiah that I don't want sacrifices. He doesn't, yeah, yeah, he doesn't I want delight to be in the blood of, of bulls and goats. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So. Um, OK, so we've read. Um, and up until the end of verse 4, if we continue from verse 5, the king assigned them a daily portion of the royal rations of food and wine. They were to be educated for three years, so that at the end of that time, they could be stationed in the king's court. Among them were Daniel, um, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah from the tribe of Judah. The palace master gave them other names. Daniel he called Belshazzar, Anana he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the royal rations of food and wine. So he asked the palace master to allow him not to defile himself. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion from the palace master. The palace master said to Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king. He has, a he has appointed your food and your drink. If he should see you in poorer, poorer condition than the other young men of your age, you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel asked the God whom the palace master had appointed over Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. You can then compare our appearance with the appearance of the young men who eat the royal rations and deal with your servants according to what you observe. So he agreed to this proposal and tested them for ten days. 
At the end of the 10 days, it was observed that they appeared better and fatter than all the young men who had been eating the royal rations. So the god continued to withdraw their royal rations and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and skill in every aspect of literature and wisdom. Daniel also had insight into all visions and dreams. So once again, we have a case of the Lord God providing insight, the Lord providing wisdom and knowledge. And at the end of the time that the king had set for them to be brought in, the palace master brought them into the presence of Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them. Among them all, no one was found to compare with Daniel, Ananiah, Mishal, and Azariah. Therefore they were stationed in the king's court. In every matter of wisdom and understanding concerning which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel continued there until the first year of King Cyrus. Um, I don't know if, if there's anything that you would like to um, say first before we continue with the second uh, chapter. Yeah, I, I would like to just point out that God rewards obedience. And we see in Daniel chapter 1 that out of all the people who were, all, all the, the people from the, the kingdom of Judah that the Babylonians took captive, it was the majority of the nation of Judah, but it was people who were old and sick and you know that that the king didn't desire but out of the ones that came into captivity i'm sure that there were probably more than just daniel um you know hananiah um mishael and azariah but these are the ones that we learn about in the book of Daniel as an example. And, well, we know that they aren't the only ones because the book of Ezekiel takes place during the same time. You know, Ezekiel was also a prophet during this time. And so, I say all that to say this. The Bible will give us just as much information as we need, mm. not necessarily as much as we want, which is why people go to all these outside places, you know, looking for secret hidden information. It goes back to that same lie you were talking about in the garden, um, yeah. you know. That, that secret hidden knowledge that the Gnostics claim to to have and uh, what Gnosticism is all about, what it's always been about. Um, but in the book of Daniel, we see uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These are the ones who we're told about, even though there most certainly was more, right? They represent hmm. the people who were obedient to God, who honored the Most High, and instead of doing the easy thing and doing what this Antichrist, like you were talking about, he is one of the Old Testament types and shadows of the final antichrist instead of you know taking his quote unquote mark with his meat and you know all the things that the Chaldeans had to try and bolster their physical appearance and their spiritual and uh, their magical abilities Instead of taking part uh, in any of that, they said, no, we are going to remain faithful to our God. We are going to follow, at that time, was the old covenant law, and that they did. And because of their obedience, Daniel actually 
got to be the Old Testament, you know, John, the apostle. You know, he got to see the coming of the Messiah, um, the first coming, and, you know, then part of the vision of the second coming and the end of the world. But Daniel and his associates represent the remnant. I, I said all that to, to say that one thing. Uh, and I didn't mean to be long about it, but the Bible doesn't, like I said, it doesn't always give us all the details, but it gives us just what we need to be able to use Scripture to interpret Scripture. And, yeah. you know, these that represent the remnant, the remnant that has always been there from the time that God you know, created man, there's always been a remnant of humans who have obeyed God, followed God, worshiped the Most High. At one point, it was only Noah and his family. And because of it, you know, they were the only ones saved out of all the people on the entire earth. Mm. But even if it was just those few, there's always been a remnant. And God has always taken care of that remnant. And he always will. Never did he take the remnant out of the world. Now, there are a few occasions where he took individuals out of the world, such as Enoch and Elijah. But other than Enoch and Elijah, there are no more examples in scripture other than our Lord himself that get taken out of the world. You know, yeah. they, they have to go through the trials and tribulation right along with the disobedient. Mm -hmm. But the difference is just as Jesus said, you know, Jesus said when he was praying to God, the father, for his disciples who would become the apostles before his ascension he, he prayed and I don't have the scripture in front of me because I'm in Daniel but he prayed Father I pray that you take them not out of this world but take care of them while they are in this world and I'm paraphrasing because like I said I don't have the scripture in front of me mm -hmm. but that is exactly what has always been, whether it was in the Old Covenant or after Christ in the New Covenant. Now, that doesn't mean that there won't be tribulation and death. Um, you know, we know that all the apostles, except for the Apostle John, were martyred for their faith. And, you know, people want to talk about how many... Um, of a certain ethnic group that were killed during World War II in, in the Holocaust, but that's nothing compared to the Christians who were killed during the Roman times. And not just the Christians, but during the siege of Jerusalem, when uh, the Romans sieged Jerusalem and destroyed the city and the temple, there was not one stone left standing in the temple. Just yeah. as Jesus prophesied. But when that happened, the Christians, they remembered when Jesus gave his sermon, his warning in Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, that said, when you see armies surrounding Jerusalem, don't even go back in the house for your coat. Run to the mountaintops. And they did. They went and they, you know, they hid in Petra. And not a single Christian died. And that's not according to me. That's according to the Jewish historian Josephus. You know, the, no, no Christians died during the, the siege of Jerusalem and destruction of the temple. But we are coming closer and closer into the end times. And we talked last time about how close we
possibly are and how it could start at any moment you know the the final or of the whole world that the antichrist the final antichrist will rise up and take power out of through peace you know not through you know war on his part but through peace and flattery and i think that it's important to look at this aspect of it because so many people have unfortunately over the past 200 years been tricked into believing that they don't have to worry about what is said in the book of revelation because they aren't going to be here mm-hmm. they don't have to worry about the tribulation because they aren't going to be here they're they're going to catch the rapture bus to heaven you know and i i say that in a kind of light-hearted way but it's a serious matter because there's not going to be a secret rapture it's it's not in scripture unless you read it into the verse it's not there what is there is not just um a maybe but a promise that the servant is not greater than the master and if our master went through the suffering that he went through then if we remain faithful to him then we're going to go through even worse suffering according to jesus and you know that's not every single person but it's definite it definitely applies to some because during the time of nero christians were literally used as lanterns they yeah. were burnt to death and they were used to light the streets <laughs> i mean that is suffering on a level that i cannot even begin to comprehend but these men and women did not deny Christ regardless of how bad this persecution and tribulation and suffering became they never once denied Christ um, I'm going to turn things back over or I can read uh, chapter 2 if you want it doesn't matter but yeah you can, you can read to us it I mean either way I just I wanted to recommend to our audience that when you have the time look up the martyrdom of Polycarp. Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna actually during the time that John uh, wrote the book of Revelation and he was a direct disciple of the apostle John but if you read the martyrdom of Polycarp and if i'm not mistaken i think you can find it in fox book of martyrs but if you just google the martyrdom of polycarp you'll find it it is a, it shows a faith on a level that i pray i'm able to have mm. when the day comes that you know i am given the choice to <laughs> not live or die based on whether I deny Christ but be tortured I mean burnt to death <laughs> we're gonna be talking in a minute about a story that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with and that's Shadrach Meshach and Abednego in the fiery furnace and you know we see Jesus was actually in the furnace with them Mm. and that's amazing but when you read the martyrdom of polycarp they tried to burn him to death as well and they yeah. couldn't they couldn't burn him to death they event- he did get killed for his faith but they eventually had to just stab him and kill him because they weren't able to burn him i don't want to ruin it for anybody but just just read the martyrdom of polycarp because it is it's a faith builder and it's something to aspire towards 
and you know I, I know that m most of the people who watch the remnant report watch it because they're wanting to hear about fringe topics and you know for the past four years we've talked about fringe conspiracy you know nephilim uh the shape of the earth anything you can think about we talked about it but the time for the fringe topics for this ministry has come and gone now that doesn't mean we'll never do an episode on a fringe topic but this program is definitely no longer a you know a a, a, a christian version of coast to coast it's just not um you know we, we are focusing on the gospel we want to reach as many people from Tertius' side of the world all the way to my side and everywhere in between. And he is as far one way as you can go and I am as far as the other way as you can go, which I believe is an, an awesome testament to how you can use the things in the world for godly purposes. You know, people yeah. use this same technology that we are using to share the gospel right now to create and share pornography. No. Yeah. Um, you know, anything that you can think of that's wicked, this technology is used to share it. So it, it's like a gun in the sense that the thing itself is not evil. It's how it's used that makes it good or evil. But I am going to, um, you said you did want me to read? Yeah, you can You can read the second chapter for us. Okay. I mean, I don't mind. I was just <laughs> trying to take some of the load off of you for reading. But, you know, it, it, feel free. Okay. You. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep was break from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came, they stood before the king, and the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show you the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me. If you will not make known unto me the dream, with the interpretation thereof, you shall be cut into pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. But if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall receive my gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show you the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of certainty that you would gain the time because ye see the thing has gone from me. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you, for ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me. Till the time be changed, therefore tell me the dream and I shall know that you can show me the interpretation thereof. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king this matter. Therefore, there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such things at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king requireth, and there is none other than that can show it before the king, except for the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. Well, they had that part right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For this cause, the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they sought Daniel and his fellows 
to be slain. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and he made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning the secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. He changeth the times and the seasons, and he removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them. I'm going to let you read since my dogs want to start barking. Okay. Um, he reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. To you, O God of my ancestors, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and power, and have now revealed to me what we asked of you, for you have revealed to us what the king ordered. Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will give the king the interpretation. Then Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king and said to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who can tell the king the, the interpretation. The king said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, Are you able to tell me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered the king, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or diviners can show to the king the mystery that the king is asking. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he, was, and he has disclosed to King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen at the end of days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed were these. To you, O King, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be hereafter, and the revealer of mysteries disclosed to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me because of any wisdom that I have more than any other living being, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the King, and that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. You were looking, O king, and there appeared a great statue. That statue was huge, its brilliance extraordinary, it was standing before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of that statue was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its midsection and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked on, a stone was cut out, not by human hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were all broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole, filled the whole earth. That was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory, into whose hand he has given human beings wherever they live, the wild animals of the field and the birds of the air, and whom he has established as ruler over them all, you are the heir of gold. After you shall arise another kingdom, inferior to yours, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over the whole earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. Just as iron crushes and smashes everything, it shall crush and shatter all these. As you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be divided. It shall be a divided kingdom, but some of the strength of iron shall be in it, as you saw the iron mixed with the clay. As the toes of the feet were part iron and part clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with clay, so will they mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron and clay does not mix. Just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall this kingdom be left to another people. It shall crush all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that the stone was cut from the mountain, not by hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. 
the great God has informed the king what shall be here after. The dream is certain, and its interpretation trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, worshipped Daniel, and commanded that the grain offering and incense be offered to him. The king said to Daniel, Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king promoted Daniel, gave him many great gifts, and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request of the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. Okay, so that's the second chapter. I apologize for having to turn it over to you like that. My wife uh, just got home. Uh, my son, my youngest son, uh, he had a friend spend the night over last night, and his friend had a basketball game, and they had gone to the game, and uh, apparently it hadn't been long got over, and they were just getting home, and the dogs were barking at them no, coming no. in. But uh, no. anyway, uh, one thing I wanted to point out <laughs> that is very different between the uh, Hebrew Masoretic, that is what pretty much every modern translation, you know, going all the way back to the Geneva Bible, King James, um, mm. you know, you read there that Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and, and worshipped Daniel. Mm. Well, on mine, which is uh, Brenton's English translation of the Septuagint, it says worship the God of Daniel. Mm. And that's just one of, of many differences. Um, but I mean, yeah. I know this, this program's got not, we're not talking about the differences between the two translations, but I just thought that was interesting because there's no way that Daniel would have allowed him to worship him. Um, yeah. It, this is a, a man who has honored God in so much and God continues to give him favor even after this. So <laughs> Daniel definitely wouldn't have allowed the king to worship him. Mm. But um, the Septuagint where it says worship the God of Daniel, that makes sense. Yeah, but absolutely. Do you want to go to chapter three now? And Yeah. Just for yeah. time's sake, that'll probably be the last chapter we're able to cover. Uh, yeah. Because we've already been going for an hour. Yeah, no problem. But, uh, chapter 3, that's where, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's where the, um, the fiery furnace is, right? Yeah, that's the, the golden image and the fiery furnace. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful, I, I think, you know, a lot of people, when they, when they hear the, the name book of Daniel or the prophet Daniel they I think most of us uh, think of the the Daniel in the lion's den but the other thing that we immediately also think of is the the golden image and the fiery furnace you know so yeah. and I think the golden image and the fiery furnace is another um, it's another foreshadowing of the tribulation and the Antichrist and his image and worshiping the image um, mm and what will happen to those who refuse to worship the image yeah and what will happen to those who worship the image um you know here we're going to see in just a minute what happens to those who refuse to worship the image and at first it seems horrible but then you see the way that god puts that covering of protection over his remnant absolutely and it comes back to um, what he said in the book of Revelation, um, where God is also described as the one who, when he opens a door, nobody can close that door, and when he That's closes right. it, nobody can open that door, and he, right. okay. he always makes a way where there seems to be no way. I mean, w w another example that I'm thinking of now is when David faced Goliath. I mean, you have you have this um, young Hebrew guy who was basically a shepherd. Now, shepherds were they were seen as like the lower part of society in those days and he comes with a sling and I, th I think everybody thought to themselves well David's going to get Goliath's going to mop the floor with him mm -hmm. um, but David knew that he, he, he shouldn't trust in his sling 
he uh, trusted in the one true creator of heaven and earth. And yeah. I mean, he nailed a man that was probably two or three times his size. Yeah, I mean, that that is a perfect example and one of the few that I can think of uh, true righteous anger. Um, you know, David didn't really care if he got killed. All he knew was here was this uncircumcised Philistine, you know, mocking his God. Yeah. And he wasn't going to stand for it. Yeah. But, uh, I, I mean, if you want to read, you can read or I can read either way. Okay, I'll uh, read chapter three for us. All right. Um, King Nebuchadnezzar made a golden statue whose height was 60 cubits and whose width was six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent for the satraps, the prefects and the governors, the counselors, the tre treasurers, the uh, justice, the magistrates and all the officials of the provinces to assemble and come to the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the prefects, governors, counselors, treasurers, justices, the magistrates and all the officials of the provinces assembled for the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. When they were standing before the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum and entire musical ensemble, you are to fall down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Accordingly, at this time, certain Chaldeans came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, shall fall down and worship the golden statue, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men pay no heed to you, O king. They do not, des they do not serve your gods, and they do not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in, so they brought those men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods, and you do not worship the golden statue I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, you should fall down and worship the statue that I have made. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire, and who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was so filled with rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face was distorted. He ordered the furnace heated up seven times more than was customary, and ordered some of the strongest gods in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. So the men were bound, still wearing their tunics, their trousers, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was so overheated, the raging flames killed the men who lifted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the furnace of blazing fire. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up quickly. He said to his counselors, Was it not three men that we threw bound into the fire? They answered the king, true. Yeah, true, O king. He replied, But I see four men unbound, walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the fourth has the appearance of a god. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of blazing fire and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, governors, the king's counselors gathered together, and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their tunics were not scorched, and not even the smell of fire came from them. Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. 
They disobeyed the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree, any people, nation or language, that utters blasphemy against the god of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other god who is able to deliver in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So, what translation are you reading from? I'm reading from the New Revised uh, Standard Version. Yeah, I was just curious. I just I saw where um, w when it got to the the part about um, didn't we throw three in? You know, I mm. see four. You know, I, I I heard you know where you said that one looks like a god, and then uh, after they came out of the fire, it said. Um, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who had sent his angel and delivered his servant. Um, I was just wondering. I was looking at the differences on in mine. It says, um, he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is that like the Son of God. And mm. it says, Son of God it's capitalized the sun is capitalized and uh -huh. uh, you know th there's other than little clues like that there's there's you know nothing that says for certain that this was jesus you know uh, uh christophany uh, and for those who don't know what a christophany is it's an appearance of christ in the old testament yeah. for his advent but we see Christophanes all through the Old Testament anytime you see the with the word the in front of it the angel of the Lord that is Christ it is the physical yeah. image of the invisible God mm -hmm. um, there are many sons of God there are many messengers, angels of God, but there is only one Son of God, capital S-O-N. There is only one, um, you know, physical image of the invisible God, the second part of the Trinity. And um, we see him all through the Old Testament. It was he who spoke to Moses through the burning bush. Um, you know, uh, it was he who slayed 185,000 Assyrians in one night. Mm -hmm. um, that's the Jesus that is going to return at his second coming at the end of the tribulation to mm -hmm. judge the righteous and the wicked. Mm -hmm. And it's that Jesus, the one who slew 185,000 Assyrians without breaking a sweat, that's going to destroy all the armies of the Antichrist with, you know, the, the, the sword that proceeded from his mouth. Um, yeah. You know, he, he's, in other words, he's going to speak, and that's it. The same way he spoke this world into existence, he's going to speak them out of existence. And, you know, Peter tells us that um, when this world is judged and destroyed before the new heavens and new earth are created, that the elements themselves are literally going to melt with fervent heat. Yeah. Now, you know, when, when you talk about the elements, you're talking air, fire, water, um, earth. <laughs> That's a hot fire. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. That can just melt all the elements, you know, be they the, the metal ore that's in the earth or, you know, diamonds or coal or or whatever you know from the mountains to the oceans God is going to 
destroy this earth, not with water the way it was destroyed the first time. You know, he made the promise never to destroy the earth with water again, but with fire. And it has to be destroyed with fire before it can be rebuilt perfect. You know, the way it was originally. And maybe um, even better than it was originally. Um, you know, I know that we, as the followers of Christ, who receive our um, glorified bodies at the resurrection, I know that that will certain. I mean, I don't know for a fact that that's going to be better than the bodies that Adam and Eve had before they sinned and fell, but I do know that it's the same body that Christ has. Uh, no. And he received his glorified body at his resurrection. You know, he's the first fruits from the dead. He is, um, you know, the the first risen from the dead. Amen. And we will be like him. The scriptures say, when mm. when we are resurrected, we will be like our Lord. Now that doesn't mean we will be on the same, you know, status as him. We're not going to have the same position as Christ. But we will be like him physically. Uh, no. So it's hard to understand now because right now we can only see through a glass dimly. Yeah. And, you know, we can only guess for the most part. We, we can make educated guesses using the word of God. But even those educated guesses at their very best are seeing through a glass dimly. But there is coming a day, praise God, and I think that day is coming sooner than many of us think, when our Lord is going to split the eastern sky, and with the trump, the sound of the archangel, he is going to return, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we who still remain will be called together to meet them in the air, and yeah. forever we will be with him from then on. And I personally cannot wait for that day, simply because I want to see the one who died for me. I want Absolutely. to see the one who who deemed such a vile preacher as me worthy to be his servant. Mm. I, I still, I don't understand it. I really don't. And if I think about it too hard, I'll get emotional. But no. honestly, brother, I just want to bow at his feet. And I want to see him and I want to touch those nailed scarred hands not because I don't you know have faith that he is who he claims to be but just so that I can see the evidence of the things that he did not just for me but for all of us amen for anyone who is watching this tonight, if you are not living for Jesus Christ daily, if you are not just like Daniel, just like Shadrach, just like Meshach, just like Abednego, if you are not being faithful to the one true God through his son Jesus if you want to know how to be faithful if you want to know how to be obedient open your Bibles and read Matthew chapter 5 through 7 start there the Sermon on the Mount that's not all of the commandments of Christ but it is a big portion of them and it is 
the place to start. Don't start in Ephesians or Galatians or Romans with Paul. Start with Jesus. Yeah. Start in Matthew chapter 5 and read chapter 5 through 7 and read it while praying. And if you are someone who has never come to Christ, you've just happened across this video and something has kept you watching it. I want you to hear what I'm saying right now. Regardless of how much you know about the Bible or know about God, hear this. There is only one true God who created the entire world and everybody and everything in it. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, in Genesis, when God created the heavens and the earth and mankind, he created man perfect, sinless. But because of the serpent tempting Eve and giving in to that temptation, sin entered into the world and ever since sin entered into the world every single human being has had a sin nature we've all been born with it and that sin nature has left a hole in our hearts a god-sized hole that we try to fill with all sorts of things alcohol relationship sex all kinds of things we try to fill this god size hole with and no matter how much of whatever it is we try to plug that hole with nothing works that same sin that left that god size hole in our hearts also separated us from god and that's what causes the hole god literally sent the way to fill that hole and reconcile us back to him he sent his one and only son who just like brother Tertius and I were talking about earlier is the physical image of the invisible God Jesus Christ he sent Jesus and although Jesus was born as a little baby in a manger, he didn't stay that way. Just like Brother Tertius says in his Revelation study, many people, especially around Christmas time, they have this idea of Jesus as a little baby and that he's always a little baby. But friends, Jesus is not a little baby. He grew up. He started his ministry at age 30. And he had the greatest ministry of all time until he died on the cross. An excruciating death that none of us could have possibly suffered through. And he did it while being sinless. He never committed the first sin, even though he was 100% man and 100% God. He had every temptation that you and I had have. He felt every lust and desire of the flesh, but he never gave in to not a single one. And yet, although he was blameless, we, mankind, as his enemies put him to death on the cross. Mm -hmm. But while we were still sinners, not only did Christ die for us, but he loved us. And he still loves us. He didn't just die, though. Three days later, after being in the grave and his spirit being in Hades for three days he rose from the dead the only person in history 
to rise from the dead without Jesus or one of the apostles bringing them back from the dead. He rose from the dead. He was seen by his apostles and in total, I think 500 witnesses. 40 days later, he ascended up to heaven where he sits right now at the right hand of the Father waiting for the day when God the Father says, go get my people. So not only did God create us, but after we chose to disobey and separate ourselves from God, putting that God-sized hole within our heart. God sent the only way that could ever possibly reconcile mankind, us, back to him and fill that God-sized hole. And that's Jesus Christ. In order to be reconciled to God, you must simply Confess with your mouth out loud that Jesus Christ is Lord. That means he is the son of God who lived a sinless life, died for yours and my sins. And then three days later, rose from the grave. You must confess this out loud with your mouth. And more than that, and with that, you must believe it. With your whole heart. If you do these two things. Then. You will. Be born again. If you make the choice. The conscious choice. To confess with your mouth. And believe in your heart. That Jesus is Lord. And that God rose him from the dead. Then. The next step. Is. To tell somebody, you must confess Jesus and be baptized. That's fully submerged into water. Now, we're not here to debate whether baptism is a must or being put on the vine and being born again. That's not what we're trying to do and that's not what we're going to do. The Bible says to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So after you receive Christ, or better yet, after Christ receives you, after you believe on him and confess him, then you find it doesn't have to be a a minister, just a Christian. I'm sure you know a Christian somewhere. Christian man. Get him to baptize you. If he won't baptize you, baptize yourself. I can promise you that if you do that, that on the day of judgment, God is not going to not accept you because you didn't have someone else to baptize you. It's not the person who's baptizing you rather than the act of obedience by being baptized but I'm sure that all of us know somebody who is willing to baptize us so get baptized and then the most important part after that is to get in the word of God every day don't just read it but study it and study it with prayer find a church a home fellowship And go in fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Go and worship the Lord every day. And I'm going to turn it over to my brother before we close out. Yeah, Jeremy, I agree with everything that you've said. And, um, you know, especially in these times we are living in where, you know, you have... You have light and you have darkness, but the thing is, darkness, uh, the kingdom of darkness loves to imitate the light. And 
you know, in our day and time, the amount of deception out there is, it's it's on a massive scale. So, you know, you have people um, pretending to be something they are not, and they twist the word of God into something, you know, they, they have their own hidden and dark agenda. So I want to really urge people to, you know, when you when you come to Christ, ask the Lord. Remember, the Lord is always faithful. You know, ask the Lord that He should help you by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit to always have a spirit of discernment. To have a, uh, a dis- you know, it says the Word of God in Hebrews 4 verse 12 is a discerner of the thoughts. Discern- remember to discern your thoughts. Discern what people tell you um ask yourself ask the lord is is this the truth go uh, check it with the word of god check it with the word of god absolutely and um you know that's that's something that i just wanted to say because um we are we are truly living in an in an as, as someone called it uh, the age of deception yeah. um, it's it's absolutely the age of deception from beginning to end and um, that's why the apostle peter tells us that we have to be sober and vigilant you know so um but I, I'm, I'm just so. I can't describe in words how grateful I am that the Lord Jesus Christ is so faithful, and that you know we know God the Father through Jesus, because Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. Yeah. And I, and I can't describe in words how thankful I am for the Holy Spirit as a guide, a comforter, and a protector. Because um, I, when I think of what. What will happen to people who don't know Jesus? You know, it's I. I it, it makes one sad to. to it should realize. break your heart. Yes. If it yeah. does not cause you pain when you think about those who are going to suffer for all eternity when they die, then you need to question whether you're truly born again, because yeah. it should not just bother you, but it should. It should hurt like losing a loved one hurts. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about all eternity. There's no more chances after death. Yeah. Once you take your last breath, you have no more chances. And unlike the false teachers in this world would have you believe, there's not many ways to God. There's only one, Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Krishna is not going to get you to God. Muhammad mm. is not going to get you to God. Mm. Buddha is not going to get you to God. You know, the, you, you can't get to God through the Sephirot tree. And there's only one God. There's only one God. There's not many. There are many who are spiritual beings there are many um in the divine council you know there are many what we in our modern terminology would consider and call angels but there's only one maker of heaven and earth there is only one righteous one with no fault no blame no beginning and no end now that's something that our (laughs) small human brains can't comprehend or at least i can't something Mm -hmm. with no beginning and no end but that's god he has no beginning and he has no end but friends i want to thank you all for taking the time to join us here at the remnant report tonight um if Brother Tertius doesn't have anything else, we're going to close the program. We've been. Yeah, I, don't, I don't have anything else to add, uh, Brother. Well, we're going to end the program. Then we've been going for over an hour and a half. and uh, We try to keep these, these episodes down to an hour, but it, it's... We also leave it in the hands of the Holy Spirit. We're not going to shut it down just because um, it's been more than an hour and we want to make sure that from now on we always share the gospel and we always close in prayer there's if, if, if nothing else 
the Lord has convicted me tremendously that this platform that he has allowed us to have should be used for the Great Commission. And no matter what we talk about, what the, the show is supposed to cover in a particular episode, we need to make sure that the gospel is always shared. And so yeah. we're gonna we're gonna do that from now on. But I thank you all for listening. Um, we're gonna just say a quick word of prayer, and then we're gonna close out. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to come together even though we're on opposite sides of the world your word says that two or three are gathered together in your name you are here also in our midst and i know that that doesn't just apply to when we are physically together because i've seen many many times the evidence of your holy spirit being among us even though we were only together through the internet or a video conference or whatever the case may be youtube live facebook live many things and i thank you so much that you are faithful even when we are not you always keep your promises mankind myself included and probably one of the worst will always always let people down in some way shape or form even if i don't mean to but you god you are always faithful you are always true to your word and i thank you so much for that father god i pray that absolutely everyone who was supposed to hear tonight's program heard it i pray that anyone who heard this program be it when it plays live or a year from now i pray that anyone that can hear the sound of my voice that does not know jesus christ on a personal level of savior and master and lord that they would take this time right now they would not put it off not one more minute and they would come hit their knees cry out and confess with their mouth that jesus is lord believe with their heart that you rose him from the dead father i thank you so much for my brother Tertius. i love him so much and i know that you brought us together even though we are literally a world apart so that we could share the gospel the good news with the lost and also edify the body of christ lord i love you and i ask all these things in the name above all names Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Amen. Brother, I, I appreciate you coming on with me as always. I truly enjoyed it. And I can't wait until we're able to come on again. I know that you're going to be doing the revelation. Um, another part you're going to be starting, what, chapter three, right? Yes, that's right. Chapter two um, just went up. Uh, today as a matter of fact and I truly hope people will pay attention and watch all of it because so far it is tremendous you know, it covers absolutely everything yeah, in an in-depth way that is needed it's truly needed most mm. people only want to focus on this part or that part you know, I, I've done many revelation studies, but I have to be honest, I've never done an in-depth one the way that you're doing it now, at least not on the, the remnant report. You know, I have in the pulpit, but I haven't, you know, on camera 
on the program. But anyways, for Kingdom Productions Network and the Remnant Report, I am the Remnant Warrior along with my brother, the Remnant Watchman, saying until next time, God bless each and every one of you. Grace and peace.